Lord, sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, we're on the third gospel lesson in the Old Testament, and we are looking at what Isaiah preached. Now, Isaiah is kind of an interesting man. Inasmuch as the Lord revealed of all the 39 other authors in the Old Testament, he was the one who has more details and is talking more about the Messiah or the Christ than any of the other authors of the book in the Old Testament. And as such, people like to say that then when you read Isaiah, you're reading the gospel in the Old Testament. Well, he has also law and he has to speak about the destruction that is coming, but he does have these beautiful visions of, we would say, is the New Testament times, the times that we live in. And so it's great to bridge, if you will, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, following the Christmas gospel here, according to Isaiah. He's talking about a son being born. That is, of course, our Savior Jesus Christ. And he's talking about how he will rule. Having been born to rule, he then will be equipped to rule, and his rule will be successful. As we look at this, and you can do this to any Old Testament prophecy, we take a look at what was said and compare it to what actually happened. And we begin with the, the idea of the times that Isaiah lived in. He lived among people who were rebelling against God, uh, they didn't want God. They, even when they heard God's majestic words, ignored them. And if it was law, even if it was the truth and saying, you, if you violate this, you will be in hell, they didn't care about it. Nothing moved them. And the kings that ruled over them, they seemed like they only made things worse. They led the people into rebellion and into immorality against the Lord God. So that was the situation at the time of Isaiah. And as we look at the time of Jesus, when he actually comes, the conditions weren't a whole lot better in as much as how many people were looking for the Messiah to be born. I mean, if the angels hadn't said something to the shepherds, who would have come that evening? And even when the kings come from the east, and they ask, where is he born, king of the Jews? We saw a star in the heavens. Nobody seemed to know it, except they were worried because Pilate was going to, or Herod was going to do something pretty terrible. So we see at the time of Isaiah, at the time of Christ coming, maybe, maybe even a little bit in our own day, right? There's a lot of people who really aren't looking for the Lord. If you ask them what Christmas is about, they'll say it's a story or a tale. It's uh, no different than what you might see on TV in these uh, fantasies about what Christmas is all about. Well, one thing's for sure. God made this prophecy so that people who are thinking, caring, the ones whom the Holy Spirit is working faith in their hearts, they listen to what it has to say and recognize something. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, reminds us of what we started out with three weeks ago when we looked at the first gospel lesson. That would be one, the seed of a woman who would come and he would then be victorious. And so Isaiah is echoing that gospel message which has been throughout the Old Testament and which we now understand is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. He will be born. It's very definite and that's what Jesus Christ was, born to Mary in the stable and laid in a manger. He was born to rule. The authority to rule will rest on his shoulders, says Isaiah. That is to say, in Jesus resides all authority. And you need only to compare what Jesus did in his life to see that, yes, he had that power that power from God. Because you can look at the words he said, 
They were truth. People understood it. He did miracles. He healed people. He fed thousands of people miraculously with just a little bread and a few fish. Everything he did spoke of the power of God with him, which only makes his rejection that much more damning to people who reject him. This Jesus came because people on earth need him. We can't save ourselves. If you think times are bad, you just have to look at it and say, well, how do we treat one another? And you start seeing the, the crimes and the, the way people decide they won't pay any attention to their neighbors. The way even we'll maybe use the pandemic to say, well, I don't need to get involved with anybody now because it's against the rules. Well, we really do need to understand who that Savior is and to ask him to rule in our lives. And when he rules, what will he be doing? What can we expect? Here Isaiah was given the vision of calling him by four names that speak sermons to us about what Jesus accomplished. The four names are Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Wonderful Counselor. Well, we know what a counselor is. It's someone who speaks and gives us help and guidance or is someone who provides structure to people's lives. A counselor has to know what they're doing. The counselor has to have goals and objectives in mind. And God had the most wonderful objective in mind, which Jesus Christ knew, and which then he followed. And that wonderful plan is to give you and me salvation. There is no one who could save us. We need this Savior. And here is the wonderful truth, if you will. When we celebrate Christmas... We don't need a lot to help us see in awe what God has done. Because we know that Jesus coming as a baby was just that beginning. And then as we continue looking at our Savior, we're going to be doing that during the Epiphany season, we see over and over again God carrying out his plan, even among people who didn't want him. But Jesus would never stop carrying out God's plan, and there is nothing can stop him from doing that. That's why the next name is pretty important for us. He's called the Mighty God. Looking at Jesus, he wasn't any different than a, any other child. You could even argue his life and circumstances were pretty poor. He was very humble in that way. And when it came to making use of his divine powers, he set them aside because he had a goal in mind, that wonderful plan again, that he would live perfectly where we can't. And because he did that, that speaks volumes to the Lord God, who would not use his mighty power and cut corners, but would make sure that Jesus would suffer, probably, in much greater ways than you and I will ever suffer. Surely that's true when it comes down to suffering the agonies of hell for our sins. The terribleness of Christ's suffering is there on the cross for us to see. Now that's a mighty God who will put aside his own being so that he could be the substitute for us. And what a blessing it is that we remember the Lord is mighty. He's not just called that as a title he continually uses his might now for you and for me to rescue us and be the everlasting Father. Now, he's not taking the place of God the Father, but like God the Father, he has in mind what a father does for a child. What does a father do for his family? And you stand guard. You provide opportunities for the whole family to share in both feast and famine. Hope the Lord, there's never really famine. It always goes from God bringing us forward in his grace and mercy till we are at last with him in heaven. We can trust then 
in the Lord being the provider of what we need every day of our lives. So that even when we have weaknesses, moments of doubt, turn to that Lord in prayer and know that Jesus Christ will be the answer. And that's what he did in his ministry, to keep on pointing to God's will and his love and his care for everyone. And when God's at work, well, that's when we see the Prince of Peace right before our eyes. Jesus being the Prince of Peace isn't that Prince who's going to then make the whole earth subdued to his will. Yes, that will happen on the last day. And yes, the Lord is here today curbing the evil that people would perpetrate against others. And yes, only God's will will be done far and above any mischief Satan and evil can bring. But he's the Prince of Peace, having established that peace, first of all, between you and me and the Lord. He did that on the cross. So we celebrate with these names, you see, the history of what Christ did. And again, did Isaiah get it right? Certainly, he is the Lord's prophet. We are so blessed to know that Jesus came equipped to do all these things that were necessary for our salvation. He is one who is carrying out exactly what God wants. And he is the one who is successful in ruling this world. Isaiah next said, There's no limit to his authority and no end to the peace he brings. That peace we enjoy is something that can be enjoyed not just for our generation, but for the generations to come. Even as that peace and joy was part of people in generations before us. There is for us then an understanding that this rule that the Lord carries out really can be traced all the way back to creation. But in particular, in the person of Jesus Christ, that little child that was born, he's been going from the day he was here on earth, carrying out God's will. Remember how people tried to capture him and, and punish him, but they could not? The only time they could touch him is when as Jesus said, it is necessary that all things be completed. And he humbled himself to suffer the way he did. But even in the death, remember, it wasn't death taking our Savior on the cross. It was Jesus dictating the terms. For when he said it is finished, he had paid the price. He drank that drink of wine, cleared his throat, and he said, Father, I commend myself into your hands. And it says specifically, he then bowed his head and died. That wasn't death raking him over the coals. That was Jesus in victory. Even the guard standing there looking at Jesus, how he then died, said, surely he is the Son of God. Well, we have such a God. And he will not be dissuaded. And he won't finish second He's always going to finish first. He is the one that the Lord promised to David would reign on David's throne, Jerusalem, or we would say Zion in heaven, and he's ruling on earth. And notice the longevity of that rule. He will be there into eternity. The hallmarks of his ruling is justice and righteousness from now on into eternity. Justice. I'm sure on some days you think that that's in short supply in the world. Justice means fairness. Justice means everything happening the right way. Would that it would happen, but we know the temptations that affect mankind, and especially if you find justice, will it be based on the righteousness of the Lord our God? Well, we pray yes, amongst us as a family of believers, that anything that's just and righteous is what God has done. Namely, he set the standard, Christ fulfilled it, and now we are blessed by the results of it. We have Christ's righteousness in place of our own sinful status. Justice and righteousness is what God is all about. Or we could put it another way, sin and grace. God is all about us 
recognizing our sins, and he shows us those sins so that he then can save us. He condemns all so he can save all, as scripture says. Righteousness and justice is the way the Lord lives. And now we are graced to be able to say, then if this is what my Savior has done, then I too should live in that righteousness and grace. That's sanctified living. So by the gospel that Isaiah is teaching, we are people who have been called to live this special life, a just life, a righteous life, not according to our own power, but according to God's, which then makes us that new creation in Christ Jesus and allows us then with the power of that Holy Spirit to live just and righteous in the eyes of God and, we pray, in the eyes of man. For this is in short supply, and we wish it would be that all people would have this as their goal, that when they celebrate with a Christmas tree, they have thoughts of righteousness and justice, the rule of the Lord God in mind. It's not just a package, songs we sing, but it's the gift that's in our hearts, the faith we have in Christ Jesus. And this is going to continue because, as Isaiah points out, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. This is God having a singular purpose. He could be concerned about many things, but each and every thing that he is doing, each and every thought that he has, comes back to how can I save mankind? And we saw it at work, Garden of Eden, when the Lord came to Satan and said, no, you shall not have Adam and Eve. They were afraid. But the Lord showed them, trust in him, and you can overcome. Same Lord shows that to us every day. And it's our job to live according to the will of the Lord. That zeal might be in our blood too. A determination. Nothing will turn us aside. A zeal to follow that Lord God. Maybe, maybe Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was tempting him to do something immoral, he said, how can I do this wicked thing and sin, and sin against God? That's the type of zeal we pray is in all of us. Because we certainly do know God's will. As we are raised in Christian understanding and truth, we know right from wrong. And then, as we learn what is right, then come the prayers. Lord, help us to be the people we ought to be. Those new creations in Christ Jesus. So you see, this really was a Christmas gospel that Isaiah was inspired to write 700 years before the beginning of what Christ would do. And we are so blessed to know Christ came as all things should be. Incidentally, when Isaiah actually wrote this, he wrote it in a style that says it has to be so, or it already has happened, though it hadn't happened. It's a future perfect tense, if you will. In the future, this is as good as done. It's in that same sort of vein that we know heaven is our home. It's as good as done as we live by faith in Christ. And so it is that we can be thankful that we are special and that this gospel message of salvation continues on today. And our thoughts and feelings about being people who receive it are echoed in the next song that we're going to sing as we respond to this wonderful understanding of our salvation by singing together the Song of Mary. You will find it on page 57 in your hymnal. <laughs> 